Hello, everybody. David Chatham here with Angel Oak Creative. Uh, we are on a, our next episode of our Talking Tough series. We are really grateful today to have Barbara Jesse Black, the Executive Director at uh, Community Works in Chapel Hill, right? You're still in Chapel Hill, Barbara. Well, actually, we're at our flagship um, campus is in Carver. In Carborough. And uh, we've had the honor of working with uh, Barbara and her team uh, over the course of uh, our time here at Angel Oak Creative and, and have just really appreciated her uh, experience and her wisdom and the work they do in the community and really wanted to take this time to talk to Barbara today about uh, driven and, and what that means in terms of having a, an organization that's driven by really solid leadership. So thank you, Barbara, for joining us today. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you, uh, your role at Community Works, and the work that you guys do at the organization. Yeah. So, um, David, first of all, thank you for uh, cons you know for reaching out to me and saying, "Hey, let's let's have a chat about leadership." And um, you know, I so appreciate you all because you're doing some amazing work around not just what you do for nonprofits in the rebranding space, but also the fact that you lift up our voices in a very substantive way, right? That's independent of well, any branding that you do. And I so appreciate the fact that, you know, I've been blessed to be a part of that, but also that you're taking the time to really look at nonprofits um, in a very holistic way and, and lifting up certain parts and pieces of what we do um, to really let the community know what we do, right? And independent of just the rebranding piece and the organizational missions that we have. So I wanted to make sure that we got that out there first. So well, thank you. Uh, it's our privilege. We we love nonprofits, and they're you know we're so yeah, grateful. We couldn't do what we do without them. So yeah. thank you. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a military brat, um, you know, and I say that with quotation marks around it because I'm 58 years old. But once you're a military brat, you're always a military brat. Doesn't you know? It's a cradle to grave kind of thing. So. Um, so I'm a military brat. I was born and raised in Germany until I was about 17, came to the States um, and have been interested in nonprofits or in volunteerism or in, so in working with, with organizations for social benefit my entire life. I always joke that my first experience sort of in the nonprofit sector was as a brownie scout. And, you know, um, raising money through cookie sales to, to you know, to, to do something, right? And so that has continued, that has sort of informed my path. Um, even when I worked in the private sector, um, you know, I, I chose a company that was doing some really good work community-wide and really appreciated that. So I've been yeah. in the nonprofit sector for probably a little over 20 years now. Wow. Um, most of that time has been as a as an executive of some sort and also as a founder. And so I come to this work, you know, with a huge passion around, you know, giving visibility to populations that are sometimes not seen and oftentimes not heard. And right. so for me, that's really important. Um, and of course, you know, it, as you can see, the mural behind us sort of articulates, that's our campus, that's our Carbro um, building. And it sort of hits, hits the high note of, of why I do the work that I do and also why our organization exists. And so that's a nice segue into sort of the community, you know, who are we as community works? Well, a lot yeah. of folks on this call, on this particular call, may may remember us as PTA Thrift Shop, and I always say to folks that our founders, we were founded in 1952, and we currently one of our our goals and missions has always been to close organ to to close opportunity gaps. And when we look at kind of historically how this why this organization was founded. It was founded because there was an opportunity gap and that opportunity gap was there was no art program in the school district at that time. And I'll give just a really brief sort of history as to why art was important. So the women that founded this organization, um, several of the women were artists in their own right. Mm. And there had been some studies in the late fifties that had said, you know, if kids are doing art, they become more well-rounded as students, but also that well-roundedness then takes them into their citizenship. Right. 
the school district didn't have any money for that. And so the thrift shop was born to create money and support for students in the classroom around art. And so fast forward to almost 70 years later, we're still doing that, right? We're still, mm -hmm. we are now not, well, COVID notwithstanding, um, we are now not just supporting students in the classroom, but we found that supporting student, students in the classroom also meant that we needed to support families outside of the classroom. So we're now looking at it from a more holistic perspective. And that is that when you support families, you also support students. And we do that in a variety of ways. So we have a very, especially during COVID, we have a very robust in-kind donation system going now where we partner with other organizations and help them to, because we're not considered a social service organization or a direct provider or direct service provider. So we're sort of that, that middleman, if you will. We're now helping other organizations to support their clients in need and vulnerable populations through our in-kind donations. We also uh, have a workforce development program that we administer, that we've administered for many, many years. I mean, part of what makes us makes our engine run is the fact that we have people that are sorting through the donations, receiving them and selling them. Right. And we also, our ecosystem is pretty broad. So we also have an accelerator space for organizations that serve youth exclusively. We, um, our goal is to provide um, a, a space and opportunity for those organizations to be able to thrive in a way that they might not otherwise be able to um, if they weren't part of this sort of larger ecosystem of other like-minded um, nonprofit organizations. So that's kind of us in a nutshell. And then of course, yeah. you know, all of that is, um, you know, has an equity component. Um, we, everything that we do is based on equity um, and we are constantly redefining that for ourselves. Um, we're an organization that's run by folks of color and most of our workforce are folks of color. And so our, our commitment is that all of what we do has an equity and anti-racist, has an anti-racist, which then leads to equity component to it. And that's how we look at our organization. So great. That's, that's well, thank you. Well, thank you for all the work you guys do. It's uh, as we learned about you and, and uh, kind of helped you through some rebranding and all, it was really uh, informative and exciting to see, you know, just how deep your roots were in the community and how much people appreciated uh, the fact that you've weathered many of many storms, right? And you've come through those. And, and, you know, the one way that you, one of the ways that you've done that is through strong leadership yourself and maybe your, your predecessors before you, but, uh, you know, as we talk about leadership, you know, what are the traits that you've seen in strong leaders? What do you see that, that, you know, when you look at someone who you see as a strong leader, what kind of traits do they exhibit uh, that they live out each day? Sure. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. So I will say that I look at leadership a little bit differently. I know we're talking, you know, our conversation is based on, you know, those of us that are, that are leading organizations that are at the helm of right. those organizations. And I would say, you know, the traits that I look at sometimes are not just the traits of people who are actually at the helm of an organization, mm -hmm. but they're people who are leading in their communities in very, in sometimes understated ways, but you meet them and you realize, wow, this person is leading because of how they move through the world, right? Less about, you yeah. know, their station in life, but more how they're moving through the world. And so I would say, for me, resiliency is huge. Um, yeah. you know, being resilient, and especially as a woman of color, I never forget that, you know, my ancestors were built on resiliency. Mm -hmm. And that is a legacy that, you know, is part of my DNA. And, and that's how I choose to move through the world. Also, for me, leadership traits that I appreciate are authenticity. Um, you know, authenticity is a really, you know, we say that it, it's such a buzzword, right? You, you need to be authentic. I'm authentic. What is keeping that? Keeping it real. Keeping it real. <laughs> and, you know, I'm always very... Um, I always look at myself and say, how am I showing up today? And mm -hmm. am I being authentic? And those folks that 
that we know those people, right? The people that show up regardless are, are authentic to their core. They don't care what other people say or think about them. And that's a trait that I'm constantly striving to, you know, to embrace fully. And yeah. especially as a non, you know, as someone running a nonprofit. Um, I would also say being vulnerable, right? So, you know, yeah. a lot of times, especially if you're leading an organization, you tend to think that vulnerability isn't a thing that you should show or that you should be because how can you be vulnerable and run an organization? But I think there's a lot of, of good wisdom that comes from being vulnerable. Um, I would also say surrounding yourself with people who are, um, you know, who are not, not just your go-to people, right. but are your support system when things yeah. don't go quite the way you need them to go. Um, yeah. And then I would say the last uh, piece would be to, to be introspective, right? Being mm -hmm. introspective. For me, that the leaders that I've known, and again, you know, that's a, for me, leadership is really broad, um, have been people who've been really introspective and who've looked for ways to continue to get to know themselves so that they could be that fully authentic individual. So I That's would, great. those are the, my top ones. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because you, yes, people, a lot of, I think some people limit themselves by thinking I'm not in a leadership position, so I can't lead. Right. right. And yet you can lead from the middle. You can even right. lead from the back. Right. right. I mean, you know, you, I mean, I think that that's where people, when you hear a lot, to your point, I think a lot of people hear leadership and they think executive director, right? But if you're a, a programs person or if you're a volunteer, even, you can lead by example. You can lead through your actions. You can lead through setting a, a, a tone or a pace for your, for the organization. So yeah. that's a great point. I think we take for granted that leadership has to be the top and right. it really isn't it's a it's a character trait that anyone can have and share it's it's whether they choose to uh, embrace that or not right exactly and I will say I've learned you know the, the one question you asked another question about you know who have been some of the the folks whose leadership you've appreciated the most and it's and I'll I would say it on, on some occasion, it's people who are running organizations. So right. I've been on a couple of boards where the CEOs of those boards have just been, you know, top notch and their leadership style has really resonated with me. And I take little bits and pieces and, you know, make them my own in, in my organization. But I will say that I've learned more from people who are leading from the, in the middle or from the yeah. middle and sometimes from the back than I have from people who are leading at the top. Because the people that are often in the back or in the middle are folks who are, who are doing the granular work, who really see it on a day-to-day -day basis and who have figured out you know, how to make things work. And so you know, my thing is, what can I learn from that? Because that then helps me to, to do my job better and to work with people and embrace people in a way that brings value. And so, and, and it's interesting, those people, those people aren't doing it from a position of power either, right? Right. They're doing it from a position of, of either interest in terms of wanting to do good in the community or in terms of passion or, you know, uh, that. So it, it is a different, uh, as a leader, as an executive director, as an executive somewhere, you kind of have an obligation to lead, right? Right. I mean, you right. know, and. And if you're in the middle, you're, you're, you're more of a choice, right? That's you can right. choose That's whether right. or not you want to. So, yeah. and not, again, I know it's always a choice, but you know, if, if my guess is that if you're not effectively leading, you're not going to be in that role very long, no matter what. So, mm -hmm. you know, people like you who have held positions and tenure for a while and, and walked through some things obviously have learned a lot and have a lot to share. So uh, what are some of those experiences you've had that, have tested you that have kind of tested that leadership ability and, and really made you a better leader over the, over the years? Yeah. So, you know, I'm always working on the, um, I don't, I'm sure you're familiar with the four agreements. Yeah. Um, and so one of the four agreements is don't take anything personally. <laughs> 
And I think <laughs> that's a tough one, right? Right. It's it's a tough one, right? And when you're leading an organization, um, especially one as old as ours in a community that is as unique as, as ours and unique, I don't mean necessarily special, but unique in the fact that it's a small community, um, you know, by, by sort of general standards and the fact that there, that this, that so much has been invested in the organization over a, a long period of time. Right. And so not taking things personally, you know, I'm always working on that. And I will say that, you know, I, a couple of, of fun facts about the organization. In the 70 year history, there have only been two executives in, who've run the organization. Wow. Um, my predecessor who was there for four years, and then I've been there the longest, which is 17, right? So wow. that in and of itself is, you know, is kind of a it's, a, it's a different animal altogether. The other thing is that we're an organization that was founded by white women. It mm -hmm. is now and has been for the last 17 years, been run by people of color, which is also which also brings a different dynamic into play. And then you think about all the innovation that has occurred in the last 17 years. Now I'll say, you know, the organization has had tremendous innovation along the way. So every, you know, 10 to 20 years, there's there have been some really big milestones and innovative things that have happened. And as you might imagine, when innovation happens, not every stakeholder is going to be thrilled with those innovations. But there's always a reason why those innovations need to occur. And typically, as, as is the case in our organization, it was to really set the organization on an upward trajectory, you know, for the, you know, for a continued upward trajectory. And that has borne itself out, right? If you look at our organization, we're se almost 70 years old. There are very few nonprofits who are the size that we are, who live that long without doing some things that may make people feel uncomfortable. And so that has been kind of my experience, right? So, you know, we sometimes- so your job is making people uncomfortable? Is that what you're saying? Occasionally. <laughs> and sometimes people forget that, you know, executive directors don't make decisions on their own. You know, board members are the ones that, you know, create the strategic direction for an organization. And then those of us that are privileged to serve, then, you know, fill, fulfill that, right? We, we're right. the people that drive the, the car, the train after that. And so I'll say that some of the defining moments for me have been just, and I, you know, I'm pretty direct. You and I have known each other for a few years now, and you know that I don't mince words. And I will say that the, the last several years, especially as we were creating this campus that you see behind me and really, you know, looking at our organization, not just from a community organization, but also how we were showing up in the nonprofit sector as a thought leader and as an innovator, right. which was, did not come with me. You know, we were an innovator before I got here. All I did was help move it along a little further. And so I'll say that a lot of what has occurred, um, the challenges that have occurred have been opportunities for me to grow personally and professionally. I'll say that first, because sometimes that's yeah. lost. But a lot of it has been around community members, some community members and stakeholders not appreciating how we needed to change and evolve in order to continue to stay relevant. And a lot of that, unfortunately, had racial overtones. And, you know, it's unfortunate to say that, but, you know, as I tell people, I've been Black a long time, and I know, you know, I know what that looks like. And it's, it's understandable to some degree, but it has also been one of the challenges and defining moments of this organization. And so when you see the mural behind me, that's on purpose, right? We were fortunate enough to have a, a connection with the town council who was looking for a place to put this mural. And we stood up and said, we want that mural on our wall because that is who we are as a, as a community, you know, community works, but also what we want our community to look like. And so I'll say that the defining moments for me have been times when my 
my innovation or the organization's innovation and the racial components have clashed. Mm. And it's unfortunate that, you know, that that has occurred, but those are things that, you know, having being real clear about who I am as an individual and who I am as a leader in the organization have really helped me to move through that. Um, right. You know, my integrity has been questioned at times. Um, you know, my character was questioned, but I always knew that number one, I didn't make these decisions on my own. So that was the first piece. And number two, this was a way for the organization to evolve in the way that it needed to and in the way that it was most impactful long term. Right. And so leading my team through that, you know, understanding that, you know, here you have a team that's mostly people of color seeing their leader who's a black woman get, you know, dragged through social media and, you know, somewhat in the press and still being able to, you know, to hold my head high and to understand that this is not about me. This is about the organization and the health of the organization long term. And I always, you know, used to say that I took my sort of how I moved through the through this space and time, a, a page from Michelle Obama's playbook about when they go low, you go high. And that's how, you know, I dealt with that for the last seven years. And even occasionally now something will pop up and I'm still doing that because it's not at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about the health of the organization and the fact that we're a thought leader in this space and thought leaders have to be innovative and look towards the future and not stay stuck in the past and not, right. and, and to some degree, not stay stuck in the present. And so, you know, my, my team has really appreciated the fact that, you know, we've made it through this, this really tough time. And you, were, you all were part of that, sort of the end of it when we did the rebrand. And that also helped to refresh, right? To really embrace who we had been for many, many years, even before I came on board, right? We had been that thought leader, that innovator for many. Right. And now to really embrace that and rebrand in a way that, let other people know, yeah, this is what they're doing. And so for, for the most part, it's been embraced in a way that um, we always knew it would, right? We just, you know, yeah. we, we, didn't look, we didn't look to the past and say, yeah, people are going to have a problem with this. We looked to the future and said, you know, people are really going to appreciate this. And, right. and that for the most part has been, has been the case. Well, you know, it's interesting is, you know, you talk about that. I mean, I was, it kind of brought me back to some of those times. And, you know, I think that uh, what I saw you exhibit during those times were um, you were you were strong and humble. Right. I, I felt like, you know, it, 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 and I don't mean, a, you know, acquiescing humility. I, I mean, more of a it wasn't a, a sense of of coming at this, of we're, we're the only way to do this. It's, right. this is the way, this is the path that we're being guided down, right? This is the path that we're choosing. And this is the way that we're going to do. Those who want to come along for the ride with us are welcome, right? Others, you know, they can do what they want to do from this point forward, right? So I think that that, you know, that, that sense of, again, there was a, a sense of, of ownership but also not of, 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 a, of a sense of, of pointing fingers or poking people, right? It was more about, look, this is our path. It doesn't have to be your path. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. you know, and I, and I appreciated that because it, it, we don't, I don't, I certainly don't think everybody's going to agree with me, right? I mean, I, right. I'm, I know that. And, you know, I don't, uh, you know, and I think that's where, as we were working with you along those, along the, the rebrand and along that path, it was, you know what, there are going to be some people who aren't going to be here anymore, but we're going to continue to do what we're called to do and what we're empowered to do and what we need to do to help this community continue to make progress, right? So, right. And I appreciate that you articulated it so much better than I just did because <laughs> you're not at all. absolutely correct. You, there are people that we knew were going to be on board 100%. And then we could we could make the list of the people who weren't going to be on board, and we were right. okay with that, right? We were okay. Right. With that. We said this is not then this path is not your path to to journey with us, 
right? Yeah. This is the path to, for those people to journey with us who understand what we're doing, who appreciate what we're doing and who want to continue to, to help us do those things. Well, as an experienced uh, and um, I better be careful here uh, <laughs> as a, as a leader with a lot of seniority, let me say that. There you go. Okay. That's good. I like okay. that. Uh, a leader with some seniority behind her. Mm -hmm. What, you know, this, this next generation, you know, we've got a generation of really, you know, really, um, you know, just committed people, right? There are causes out there. Um, some that you guys focus on, others that other people have priorities about. What, what would you encourage this next generation of leaders since, Technically, we can all be leaders in our own way, sure. but maybe specifically looking at the leaders of organizations, you know, these people who are, are hopefully moving into those roles, what kind of advice would you give them to help them prepare and, and use the experiences that they're going through today to become a better leader, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Yeah, I'll say that I'm super excited when I meet young people who are interested in the nonprofit sector. I am just beside myself excited, right? Because that those are the people we need. Um, I always say that young people and by young, you know, pick a number. They look at the world, their expectation is different than, than even my generation and yours, right? You and I are close in age and, you we know, are. sort of we're in the baby boomer sort of gen. Even though I look considerably older than you, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, even, you know, we were, our expectation was that things were going to change, but right. that, you know, that you had to, you had to sort of wait your turn, so to speak. Be patient, right? Be patient. That's it. And then this next generation is not interested in patience. I would <laughs> say to people, you know, they grew up, most of the folks who are coming out of college now, who have an interest in the nonprofit sector came up during a time when Obama was president. And you can feel however you want to about him, but the fact that you had a black man in the White House, the expectation that students are coming out with is very different. Mm -hmm. And the work that they're willing to put in is also very different. Yeah. So what I say to folks who are kind of thinking about the nonprofit sector is number one, make sure you take a finance class. Mm. That's interesting. Uh, that would have been my first well, uh, thought, but you're right. Take a finance class because, first of all, you the soft skills that it takes to run a nonprofit and the sort of the leadership skills, those are you get those as you're moving through college and those will serve you well. But the thing that a lot of folks are missing is that finance piece. You have to understand how the numbers work in order to be effective. Mm. And so for me, that would be a place that I would say, you know, that's that that's one piece of advice. I would also say, don't be afraid to innovate mm. and take risks. And I, I would say that this generation that we're talking about is not afraid to do that. But <laughs> when you're, you know, when you're faced with your first, you know, leadership position or executive position, that might not be your go-to move. Right. But I would say, you know, take those risks, be innovative be open to, you know, to all that, not just the sector has to offer, but partnerships that you can make cross, cross sectorally. So, you know, private sector, um, you know, relationships, et cetera. I think on a personal level, the don't things, don't take things personally has to be your go-to move from day one, because there are, you know, as you and I've discussed, there are people who are gonna push back on you no matter what you do. You can't make everyone happy and there's no point in trying to make everyone happy. And so no, understanding that not taking things personally can get you very far. Mm. I would also say self-care is huge. Um, you know, as you, as you and I know, the nonprofit sector is an amazing sector to work in, but it has a huge burnout rate. And if yeah. you're not creating some sort of self-care, you know, methodology for yourself, um, you really, you, you, you're not able to, to move forward the mission or the vision that you've set, you know, that, that the organization needs and has set forth. 
Um, and then again, you can only burn so hot for so long, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I, you know, again, being open, just being open and, and making sure you ask questions. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times when I first started, I had come from the for-profit sector. And so I was used to a certain way of, of corp, you know, the way corporate folks move. But if this is your first job coming out of college and you have this passion for nonprofit, ask all the questions that you can possibly think of because no question, it, it truly is, you know, it's true. No question is a dumb question. Right. The more questions we ask and put out there, um, you know, the better off we are. And then the last thing I'll say is, making sure that that you work that the anti-racist work that you bring to the organization and this is especially important for um for young white people who are coming into the sector um you know who are working with organizations for whom the the, the main constituency are vulnerable populations which are typically populations of color to make sure that you're doing your own work around that and mm -hmm. always keep in mind what's important for the organization and the people that you're serving and to bring them that to bring them into the tent to not feel that you are doing for them but that yeah. you're doing with them um, yeah yeah that savior complex right exactly. yeah. yeah 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 well that's great yeah i love the i'll love all those but i, I especially um i love asking questions right I mean, that's one reason i like doing these interviews because i get to I get to ask some questions and listen, you know, hear those. I, I need to work on my listening skills as my wife reminds me, but uh, I, uh, you know, I, I love, I love learning more each day from people. And, you know, you, again, we're close to probably the same age. I think uh, if I remember correctly, Barbara, and, you know, I've been doing this world marketing world for about 25 years or so. And it, it, I'm just reminded each day of how much I don't know. And what, and that doesn't mean that I'm not competent. It just means that I've got more opportunity to learn more, to do better, to do those things. So I do, I love having that pot. You, the, the best leaders are always learning, right? I think, I mean, that they're not at a point where they know it all. They're not at a point where they expect other people to know it all. Right. They are in a process of learning uh, constantly. And that, and again, I see that in you as well, that that's not, you don't, to me, that's part of that humility is that you, you come at things looking for the, the answer for everyone that's, that's collaborative and you don't necessarily, and, you know, you mentioned having an open mind and being open about things and, and that's, you embody those things. So uh, thank you for, for that. And I think if anybody would like, you know, wants to learn more about how you, you're, how your organization leads in the community and also how you're leading that organization along with all of your team that they should certainly reach out to you and, and oh, find out more. How can people learn more about uh, community works, what you guys are doing and sure. um, maybe even get involved? Yeah. So, um, you know, of course our, our main place is, is our website, which is www.communityworks with an X nc.org. We also have an online store now, which is kind of cool. You can access oh, it nice. through our, um, through our main website. Uh, so, you know, check that out because we're trying to, again, trying to innovate um, during, during COVID we pivoted and we now have an online store, which is pretty robust. Uh, once you're on our website, you know, there, there are ways to get involved as a volunteer. There are ways to, to donate funds. And of course, you know, there are ways to donate clothing, uh, um, merchandise, you know, for, um, for our retail and, you know, just see what we're about. Our accelerator space, that is also on our website. So it's Youth Works on Main and that's one of our programs. You can click through and find out more about the organizations that are part of um, Youth Works on Main and some really great work is being done um, on behalf of young people in, in our community specifically but also more broadly in the triangle so we're, we're yeah and that yeah that's such a unique program if uh, people don't know about it i encourage them to learn more about that there aren't too many of those around and uh you guys are really setting the standard for what they look like so yeah, yeah youth works on maine is exciting that i think that's even one way that you and i first got connected yeah, was right. through 
was through that. So, yeah. um, you know, well, Barbara, thank you so much for your time oh, today. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your experience. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to sharing that with, uh, with our community. And uh, for people who are interested in more of these, uh, you can go to nonprofittough.com. And there are more of these interviews there with other leaders like Barbara. So thank you all. We look thank forward to staying in touch. And uh, Barbara, we'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Great. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.